It's my pleasure now to introduce our final of the research speakers um, for this morning. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ben Amick, who is the scientific director and senior scientist at the Institute for Work and Health here in Toronto. He is a professor of behavioral sciences and epidemiology at the University of Texas School of Public Health. He specializes in using social science theories and methods to better understand the cause of illness and disease in society. And as Ben told me this morning, he, is where he does research to try to create healthy workplaces. Ben. Thank you. I'm going to try to be a good actor and just stay in one place. It's not my normal <laughs> ilk, but uh, um, so if I look fidgety, it's just me being fidgety. Well, what I'd like to talk to you about today is some work that actually we've been doing in Texas. And uh, it happened as a result of a, uh, yes, Texas. Um, it, 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 it happened as a result of uh, me being in an office right next to a rabbi who had just been uh, retired from a very large congregation in Houston and had been asked by the president of the Health Science Center to come in and to really think about how to imbue the notion of the human spirit and ideas of healing back into the curriculums of all the different educational programs at the University of Texas. His name is Sam Karf. And since then, he has um, worked to create the McGovern Center for uh, Health, Humanity, and the Human Spirit. And he's just one of these very interesting um, gentlemen who has a long history in social justice and social transformation in the United States. Um, and uh, he's a compelling person and uh, compelled me to engage him in uh, a journey. So this is a bit of a journey that we're on together uh, to really address a problem that he had which was he didn't like being a patient in healthcare settings. He felt it was very dehumanizing, and he felt that it was just really a, a, a horrible experience. And um, he came to me, and of course, being a great rabbi and a rabbinical scholar, you know, and a wonderful person, they always think that it's all about the person, and they can just change the person. And it's really, you have to have that internal discovery. And well, I come from a different perspective, and I said, no, 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 we, we have to do some of that, but we also have to change the workplace. And, and Sam, if we're not going to change the workplace, then it's never going to change. And it can't just be changing small pieces of the workplace. We have to transform workplaces. It ha we have to really be engaging in organizational transformation here. And um, so we started on the development of a program, and it's a program that's still in development. Uh, we've done some work, and I think the message that I want to give everybody today is that there are some pretty basic models for how you can change organizations and even healthcare organizations to improve health and that mental health is a core component of that and I think everybody who's in this room is not shocked to hear that. I think uh, the, the most recent exchange we just had about you know if you really want to care for workers yet if you really want to care for the patient you need to care for your workers first. It, it's just not rocket science but how do we do it and, and really how can we start to uh, build the body of evidence that, that, that makes it harder and harder for people to say, this is hard to do. Because we really do know how to do this. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about first are high engagement uh, work environments and what do they mean. Uh, this, is the, this is the buzz framing for those of you that follow organizational change. You know, it changes every three to five years. Um, and uh, th th this is rediscovering something that the, uh, the people in Scandinavia were talking about in the 50s and 60s. Um, so we all go in cycles. For those of us who have been in the field long enough, uh, we recognize them. Um, and it's a focus on job content as opposed to job structure. And, and surprise, surprise, what we do in our job matters to us. Um, and so high engagement work is work where the worker experiences a positive work-related state of well-being. Pretty straightforward. Workers report a strong sense of fulfillment in work. Workers experience a high sense of work identification, work that brings a sense of meaning to life. It's driven, high engagement work, by job resource, for example, creativity at work, not personal traits. 
And when you talk to healthcare workers, these are all characteristics of what they tell you about the job that they wanted to do when they started on their own journeys. So high engagement work environments are um, an environment with opportunities in, to engage in work that has meaning, is more than a series of tasks, is a calling or vocation. It allows creativity. A work environment that supports meaning-centered work where it is experienced as a calling or vocation. And I'm speaking to the choir here, but healthcare work could be meaningful and rewarding. Uh, qualitative work, and I think we've heard more of it today, supports healthcare workers get meaning from connecting with others, not only patients, but with, co with colleagues. Nurses report the most important, enjoyable part of work is helping patients and families. Connecting with others may provide healthcare workers opportunity to be creative. Again, we heard about that. There's a knowledge exchange, and there's creativity in that. So now what I'd like to talk to you about is a program that we've developed. This is a, a model of it. It's called the Sacred Vocation Program, which is really a bad name because it makes people think that it's a religious program, and it's not a religious program. It does have a spiritual component to it. Part of the meaningfulness of work is a spiritualness. Um, and um, it's, this picture should not look any different than any other picture you've seen for people that are engaging in organizational change. You involve facilitators in a process where you're engaging management and staff in ongoing organizational change to change the content of work, how people behave, their attitudes, and their mental health. And then you'll notice on the, the right side there, those are the big benchmarking indices that most healthcare settings are holding themselves accountable for now, which is patient satisfaction, patient safety, employee safety, and employee retention. We have a little problem with employee retention in the United States. It's, it's not a little problem, it's a big problem. Um, we have a little problem with patient safety in the United States. It's not a little problem, it's a big problem. We have a little problem with employee safety in the United States. That's a humongous problem that we're just starting to discover. And of course, um, we have a lot of knowledge about patient satisfaction and know what drives it now, but we don't really have the solutions as much as everybody thinks. So this is a program that represents basically the, well, I'll describe the program as it, was, as it was implemented and then we can go forward. This is a program that reflects three things. It reflects the notion that often we engage in organizational change without really paying attention to the workers that we bring into the room. And I like to call that developmental suck-in. You know, we assume that everybody who comes into the room wants to engage in change. Most people don't. Most people have been told throughout their lives that they can't make a lot of change. They don't feel that they can. They've internalized this oppression. And we really work very hard as a society to do that. And that happens both here as well as in, in the states. And so you have to do something to get people to feel that they can engage in change. Otherwise, when you engage in a change process, it's, it's a muddled and messy thing. The second part of this, though, is that you really do have to engage in change. And that's the second disaster of developmental sucking, which is you bring people together and you tell them they can change and then you don't let them change anything. That's the real nightmare, right? But they're both together and they're connected. And, and in the United States, this often gets manifested in the research world as the difference between worksite health promotion and occupational safety and health. So like the worksite health promotion people focus on individuals and the occupational safety and health professionals focus on changing the work. And guess what? You've got to do both. Again, we've known this for a long time. It's not new. But we combine them. So basically, we have a program that is, takes about uh, 14 weeks for people to complete, to participate in. Um, and it has a series of products that it produces as part of the program. Because you know, people like to see the benefits of their, the outcomes of their work. And it's just a useful thing to have people do. So in, in the initial part of the uh, program, we engage people in a, a process of dialogue and exchange about their work, and they develop a set of coping tips. They're their coping tips, and they're typically either for a unit in a healthcare setting or for a group. So for this organization that I'm going to be talking about today, it's patient care assistance in a large hospital setting. And this is an example of some coping tips. And I, and I show this to you just to show you that, that in fact, these aren't things that are 
a big deal in the sense of anything that anybody in this room probably hasn't heard before. But you can imagine a group of people that have never really produced a product in their organization for their organization, and now they not only have this, but it then gets posted. And everybody's talking to them, oh, wow, you were part of this. So it's a very simple symbol. But it also becomes instrumental, because in doing this, they do some role playing. And you can imagine that when we do role playing with the patient care assistants, the patient techs, what are they doing? They're role playing how the nurse treats them. When you do the role playing with the nurses, what are they doing? They're role playing how the doctor treats them. So we all know that there are hierarchies in, this, in the organization. And then sometimes people will role play the hard patient. And uh, these are the coping tips for how you deal with that. They emerge from that. And then at the end of the, this initial period, we actually have people do an oath. And th this is um, something that's uh, been very interesting for me. Um, it wasn't one of the things that I was really wanting to do early on in the program, but, the, uh, but we've, we're doing it. And uh, the oath is something that they actually, I was looking in my wallet, I usually carry one with me, that gets laminated, and then they put it and they hang it. And they walk around with these. And we've had patient techs do this. We've actually, this is one from one of the early groups that we did because people have the power to heal and the power to harm in healthcare settings. And that's a very powerful statement for people to make that I have the power to heal. We've had um, people in admissions participate in this and say that they have the power to heal and the power to harm. Everybody who touches somebody in an organization has the power to heal and the power to harm. We've had physicians do it. They love this. We've had nurses do it. We've had maintenance people do it. 